Hi, this is Beate Norden. I'm the founder of Team Talks, and I'm about to be on the Prosperity Show with Prosper. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of the insights of how you can help your teams to be more productive, more healthy and happy long term. And the best of all, if you're a leader, you'll find out it's not all on you. So looking forward to sharing with you some of my personal stories of why I became um, what I am today and hope to see you on the other side. Hello again and welcome back to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show where we uncover the secrets of success and obviously sprinkle a little bit of laughter along the way. The subjects that we hold here are heavy subjects, but if we don't laugh, hey, some people might actually think we are getting crazy. Now, I'm your host, Prasper Tarowinga, and today, get ready for a ride because we've got a guest who's just about to turn your workplace world upside down in the best way possible, I'm guessing. Now, Beata, how are you doing today? Hello, and thanks for having me. I'm really well, thank you. I'm reading from Sydney. Oh, fantastic. And for those that are meeting Beata for the very first time, let me take you out of your misery. She is the workplace magician, and she weaves her spells to transform those dreary office and vibes into a place where high fives are flying higher than all the stress levels that people have when they show up at work. Now, but hey, don't let her serious side fool you. We've been having a lot of laughs and uh, speaking um, PC and Deutsch, weren't we, Beate? Ja, absolut. Und direkt aus Hamburg, Hochdeutsch. Ach so. Now, ich, ich kann um, ein bisschen Deutsch sprechen und ich weiß es nicht, what I'm going to say next. But hey, that's the best I can do on <laughs> short notice. <laughs> I understood what you said. Very good, very good. <laughs> great stuff, great stuff. Now, in this episode, we're going to be diving deep into Beata's bag of tricks and covering how she actually turns those workplaces from energy draining to energy gaining paradises. So buckle up because this promises to be one of those best episodes you just don't know how you stumbled upon. But yeah, we're here now. Now, Beata, sounds like so much is happening behind the scenes there. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you actually got into this world of transforming workplace and cultures. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much for um, for the opportunity and having me here today. And my passion is certainly this. So my mission, my personal mission is that we come to work firstly with the intent to lift each other up instead of putting each other down. So, and only after that, we then think about doing a good job, right? But if we would all have the KPI to think, okay, i I made one person feel good about themselves today. As a result, what would happen to the whole energy of the company? Yeah, so that is my dream. We come to work to lift each other up. Um, why that is my dream, I think for always since, you know, I'm born with that gift of connection. If you look at the Gallup strength test for those that are in the HR or leadership development um, space, my first strength is connection. I help build bridges between people. Um, and it probably comes right from the start. You know, I, I grew up in a big family um, on a small farm in Germany, four siblings, uh, no money, parents that did the best they could with the resources they had available, including education and conflict management skills, which weren't very good. And I, I think I just had that natural gift of trying to build bridges and be the diplomat to create a space where we all feel seen, validated and, and recognized. And that's really where my passion comes from. Mm, I quite like that. And thank you so much for sharing that snippet of your history right there, because so many problems in life emanate from connection with other humans and the communication mm -hmm. thereof. And if we can fix that, I think we wouldn't be having as many of the problems that we 
have um you know in the world right now now you spoke about a german farm you see i'm a big fan of kartoffel und apple um you know and a bit of beer to go with that what were you guys farming on on the farm um we were uh so we had a dairy farm so milk um and and crops and when you are have a dairy farm or anything with animals really uh the downside is that your work is 24-7. There's no weekend. They don't care much about the weekends, right? So every morning, every evening, you have to be there for for the animals. And I think that was one of the biggest things where my parents just were always, always, always on at work. And, and again, that's probably the parallel to where we are today in the workplaces mm-hmm. or in families. When do we have time these days to actually relax and enjoy that connection with our family you know that sitting around the fire scenario where we dance and have fun together or play a board game and connect as humans um so there was not a lot of time for that when i was growing up but yeah dairy and crops going back to your question oh absolutely i can imagine the dairy farm is early starts and late uh finishes because you gotta obviously get it get to the cows very early in the morning Uh, yeah. and finish up and maybe when they're calving there's a lot of stuff that needs to be happening in the process there as well i can picture you with little wellingtons and maybe carrying the calves was that was that you there beate or was that somebody else you were busy <laughs> conflict managing the whole farm <laughs> uh i was lucky i was the youngest of four so you know <laughs> So out of all I probably had it best um you know how parents are with the first few and then after a while they just don't care much anymore. <laughs> so um I think I was lucky to be the youngest uh but I did absolutely help on the farm yeah and I loved the little calves feeding them uh so the way we did it we took them actually from the mother quite early and then we had buckets of milk um that we prepared and then we fed the little calves and yeah it was so cute I loved that one Absolutely. But obviously you must have not read the signs on the autobahn because as soon as you left the farm you drove all the way and ended up in <laughs> Sydney. Um <laughs> Yeah, it was a bit too fast. I just I couldn't even see where I was going. <laughs> I couldn't wait. I couldn't get away fast enough put it that way, right? <laughs> and far away like there's no further place other than New Zealand away from that place. So Yeah. Good Thank pick up. <laughs> fantastic. So, um you did mention in 2001 you found yourself in Sydney. Tell us a little bit about that connection because that's a whole different uh world in and of itself, a whole different culture and a whole different experience. Yeah, yeah, totally. Look, I um growing up, I had a it's a, it's a bit of a again a back story. I had a godmother which wasn't my real auntie. and she went to new on a trip to new zealand and she brought me home a dollar a new zealand dollar and a little uh, a little figurine of a kiwi and i was i think 11 or 12 at the time and that really really sparked my interest and my curiosity um and i just thought i want to go there one day like that was i think that that's really stuck in my mind and then as i was going through high school I was planning to go straight after high school and I wanted to be that nanny that au pair just to experience that far away place with koalas and kangaroos and snakes and spiders because that's all we know um over in Germany when we talk about Australia. Um so that was always my dream and then it was a bit of a trouble at the time Australia hasn't had, it shows my age right Australia hasn't had the work and travel visa yet. So I there was actually no easy nanny or au pair visa at the time and then i had another opportunity within germany anyway i did that in my university and then i had some work experience and by the time i was 25 i finally hit the road and i thought okay this is the day i had the opportunity for a six weeks holiday during work and i went traveling around australia and that was the starting point where i thought i got to come back fantastic but you only had 6 weeks but 5 years later you were still around is it because there was no visa that was stopping you from 
uh, being <laughs> deported from the country because <laughs> now that you're here, they were not going to take you back to that farm, were they? No, no. So I did the six weeks, then I went back home to Germany. I had to, but um, I then started to apply for big visas, like the skilled visa. Um, and I think by then, which because it was already five years, six weeks later, uh, six years later, I, there was a work and travel visa. Plus, I met a man on my travels who's still my husband. So that helped with a long term stay in Australia doing the partnership visa. Ah, oh, fantastic. And congratulations. I mean, obviously, you would have, uh, that man wasn't Steve Irwin, was it? Because <laughs> I'd be more famous. <laughs> Absolutely, because a lot of people, when they come to Australia, they always have this allure of the, um, you know, Crocodile Dundee or somebody like that sort of. Yeah. Sort. So what was your view of Australia? I'm going to ask this as somebody who also migrated to the country. Uh, first of all, maybe talking in terms of um, how you, you, you were able to find work and what sort of environment was it like uh, within the sort of culture? Uh, yeah, so. talking yeah, talking about culture, I thought Australia was definitely very, very welcoming. Um, and the way you start for work, I actually ended up working in recruitment and uh, in, in HR later on. What What's really tough is the beginning because everything that you've done overseas doesn't count at all. Like from a recruitment perspective, it's like, oh, yeah, sorry, we don't know about that you've done that overseas, that means you have no skills. So you kind of start very low at a very low rate. And then, and then I travel and I started to work in travel, which is low paid anyway. However, what happens then once they see your op, your abilities and potential, that was my experience anyway, they promote you up very quickly. So you start low, but then potential is there. You're being promoted up, and um, and that's where it continues to to grow quite quickly. So the progress is very can be very fast in Australia, faster than in other countries, mm. and from my experience. Fantastic. So obviously you had first hand of what team development should look like, especially from somebody who is qualified, but obviously you are being subjected to a lower rung just so that you could earn your stripes um, mm. and things of that nature. And maybe it's because you hadn't lost the accent as yet, because then they would have wanted somebody who would say, hey, guy, mate. <laughs> Yeah, it was actually handy because I worked in travel working with backpackers, so they liked the different languages. <laughs> no, no, it was really good. Um, I, I felt very welcomed. And I think one thing that Australia does very good, like Australians do in general, is a quick, a quick um two-level connection where we build trust quickly. Um, and then it takes a long time to go really, really deep. Um, so you can call that, uh, it's a bit like the sheep uh, and the wolf, in, what's it called, you know, the wolf inside the sheep. So it's very fluffy on the outside, but then to get to the core is um, can take a little bit of time um, for the real consistency. Like me as a German, I was like, for instance, I was new to Australia and they would say, oh, Beata, lovely to meet you. We should catch up for a barbie one day. Right. Right? For barbecue. So barbie, barbecue. And I thought, cool, they like to catch up for a barbecue. So I would call them back a week later and I say, let's catch up for a barbecue. And they're like, that's not really what we meant. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was a bit of adjustment of language. Um, uh, but, yeah, no, very, very accommodating, very quick. Trust, but not long-term, 100% commitment. I think that's probably how I would describe the Australians in general. Absolutely. You see, that whole, uh, I think they call it um, figure of speech, you know. Yeah, let's, let's do something, you know what I mean? And um, yeah. ah, I've got friends, and only to realise uh, you still have a long way to go. You see, um, yeah. I also had, when I was 13 years old, we had an Australian exchange student teacher 
who came to my school in, in Zimbabwe, in, in Africa. And when they came in, you know, we, you know, exchanged uh, contacts and things like that. And we just got really familiar with them. And mm-hmm. they said something to me, which now became the North Star of what has become of myself. They mm-hmm. said, Beata, if ever any one of you kids is going to be in Australia, yeah, you should ring me up and we can have a cuppa. So mm-hmm. that was said in jest, but I now took that as a challenge. And mm-hmm. here we are. So half of those things, they, you know, people say that, but we take them the bottom and only to realize that's not exactly how it it works. <laughs> so there you go. I'm I'm now stuck here in Melbourne and you're talking about Barbies. I'm still waiting for that shrimp on a Barbie that everybody <laughs> talks about. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, so did you did you end up did you end up meeting your teacher once you got to Australia? I did. I had to, I had to make sure. I had to make sure we had that couple. Otherwise, this would have been a waste, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Having come all the way to just you know watch kangaroos and koalas is not <laughs> is not what yeah. I anticipated. But yeah, you know, I digress. Coming back to your story so you're in Australia now and you're figuring out that this is what it's about so you then came up with a unique framework um that you now utilize for team upliftment that's really got everybody buzzing could you you know Mm. walk us through that framework and what that means for people that would um um you know experience it and and put it in simple terms those that people are not going to hold you against yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, um, from from back then to 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 the framework, there was a bit of a story. I basically um, from Australia, I went back to Germany for ten years, where I had my first management role uh, back then for a company called Manpower, a pretty large recruitment agency. And when I was a manager for the first time, I got really great leadership development training. And when I got back into the office, having all that knowledge. I thought, damn, now I've got all the knowledge. My team doesn't. And there's actually a higher disconnect now than it was before. But I'm not a facilitator. Back then, I wasn't a facilitator or a trainer. So I got probably even more frustrated with them because I saw what was happening, but they didn't. Um, So as a transformation specialist and someone that is that diplomat, I... I did what I could back then to give them all the content I had, but it would never feel the same way because there was never time. I didn't have the right stories, and we know we need stories to, you know, to do things and for for things to sink in properly. So, so what I developed ten years later, because technology now gives us what we, what I needed back then, is a framework where the leader and the team together can go through a leadership development program so that collectively the whole group is uplifted at the same time. So think of it as a rising tide lifts all ships. Yeah. So when we think of teamwork, the team will never be higher than its lowest chain or its weakest chain. If you think of um, a wine barrel and there's a hole in it and that is the weakest link, you will never have more wine than that hole. That, that hole. That's why, in my perspective, when we look at the team as a systemic organism, we have to lift up the whole team, including the weakest link, to collectively grow. Uh, And that is um, that's coming from the systemic team coaching thought leadership of um, Peter Hotkins or uh, or uh, Clutterbook um, Clutterbook I forgot his surname David Clutterbook, um, which are world leading and team coaching. So what I developed is this. I say every week, sorry, every month, we have a team ship habit. So the whole team goes through a certain process and learning process every month. Um, And the framework is think on your own, pair with a peer and share with a team. Think on your own is we all learn, think of it as a book club for teams, just on steroids. So think on your own is about learning something new together and ideally something that connects to the human human skills. 
communication, trust, psychology, neuroscience, conflict management. There's so many things. But just start with one thing. Let's think on your own for two weeks. Then in week three, you being you and I, let's say we are in a team, we would be paired up as buddies and we talk about what we learned. Now, when you are coming from an adult learning perspective, which is what I'm educated in, the moment we talk about what we learned, that's when we make connections in the brain for impact, for reflection, for retention, and that's when we actually start to go the higher level of recognizing what we actually learn. And that reflection practice is what we do in a one-on-one conversation. And then in week four, the whole team comes together. Now that we all learned, we all had a one-on-one conversation in a safe environment. As a team, we then talk about it. Okay, we learned today, this month about trust, let's say. What does it mean for our team? How can we build more trust? On a scale from one to 10, where are we today? With our trust level as a team and where do we want to be in a year's time and what do we need to do to get there? But now we have an elevated conversation because we're all on the same page. Right. Yeah. So that's, and that's only month one. Now imagine that every, every month we pick one topic. How much bigger would our team be in consciousness collectively after 12 months? I like that because, yes, yes, yes. I I like that because so many times when people go to work, just like your example of people saying, hey, come, let's have a barbecue. First of all, they don't have anything in common with you. But if you start pairing people up and they're talking, you know, various subjects that are not predominantly work related, it now puts more conversation instead of just the water cooler thing and accountability for them to have to learn something because you don't want to be embarrassed in week number three um, for not having anything to contribute. And when the team meeting happens, everyone is now on the same page. And what that does is like, you're right. It it really, really elevates everybody else. I'm, and I'm thinking that's the whole scope of how it works because once you get people talking, things, ideas, collaboration starts to actually happen and then people are actually invited to barbecues for real this time yeah <laughs> i like i like it how you connect it i love it <laughs> yeah but so true you know that is the it is as simple as this framework gives you permission to protect time in the diary to have a one-on-one meaningful conversation with a peer, not about work, but about the human connection. That's what it is in a very simplified way. Give you permission to protect time in the diary. And we all know that connection is the number one competitive edge for any successful team. It's not technology, it's not the best strategy, it's not the right new process, and it's not the fancy IT system. Your competitive edge and all research confirms that is how good is our team connected? How safe do we feel each other? How courageous can we be in giving us honest feedback? And how much do we care for one another as a person, not just as a resource? And that is nothing that happens overnight, and there is nothing that we can do at a team rope climbing event or at a, we're going out for drinks once a month. This happens through meaningful, vulnerable conversations again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And the best thing is, if you're a leader and you're interested in that, you will realize, boy, there's not too much I have to do. Absolutely, because now the people are collaborating behind the scenes because now they're, They've realized the sense of empathy amongst each other based on a shared goal, common knowledge. And some of the things that you are sort of talking about is soft skills, which a lot of people don't necessarily have, like obviously communication and that connection and some self-awareness. Because if you start talking to someone, they're bound to pick up on, oh, you could say this a lot better or you could act a little bit better and people are in like you say a safe environment where they don't feel 
judged because so many people would show up at work and they're afraid ah these people are going to yeah. think such and yeah. such about me yeah so this peer talk is really the i think the real difference to to any other program that you would see um the one on one connection point in between we often have workshops with everyone but what happens because of different personality types there will always be the loudest people in the group and then there's the introverts that kind of hold back and, and some people also need more thinking space when they're you know when someone would ask a question they like to think more and when you have that space of a one on one there is no group dynamics Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just one on one. You can't bail out basically, and you actually have time to think. And because you go through the content prior, you already have time to think. And in the peer talk, there is a conversation guide I help with, so we know what to talk about as well. But yeah, it's very powerful. A lot of people shy back from it at the beginning, and then afterwards they go, "That was the best thing of the whole program." Okay, yeah. does this have to be? Does this have to be done in person or can it also be applied to remote teams because so many people are working remotely right now and that whole communication is not there but if you can literally just do a one to one zoom with a peer and things like that that would actually create a lot more bonding um you know with my team based in Bujumbura Yes where is that Bujumbura <laughs> did you just make that up or do you have a team there <laughs> well <laughs> we have a team everywhere else uh, you know in, 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 um, in, in Bavaria in, in Bujumbura in Islamabad you know how, how are you ever going to connect with those people unless yes, there's some sort of facilitation and yes, this is exactly what you're right with. This is what you're yeah, exactly right. It was actually not intended, but I started when COVID just with, with the whole program when COVID just started. Um, and because I connected with so the learning happens through an app, uh, which is um, a third party provider. So it's a micro learning app. So everyone can do it anywhere. And yes, the one on one conversations can be set up anywhere in the world. And I have clients I had a, I have clients that were in Kuala Lumpur, uh, but they were all working from home at the time because they still had the what was it called? They weren't allowed to go to the to, to work. Um, yes. Isolation. I forgot about this language. Social distancing or... Yes, thank you. Social distancing. So they, they all work from home, but because of this program, they connected more. And then I had remote teams where they had some people in India, some people in Melbourne, some people in Sydney, some people in Perth, some people in Hong Kong. And again, because it was the pairing, uh, we could all do it at the same time. So it was a great way to connect remote teams and make new people included as well because, you know, they can jump into that at any given time. Absolutely. And, I mean, your commitment to transforming workplace culture is, is very admirable, especially these days where people really need that connection to feel valid and also prevent um, conflict, you know, why? Because we're mixing so many cultures, we're mixing so many backgrounds together, and someone might just say a snide comment on Slack, only to realize that that has made somebody call in sick for the last two weeks. And mm. um, I'm not going to name names for those that are in my team, but at, at any given moment, things like that are happening. But <laughs> can people take these strategies at home as well. I'll just maybe look at your scenario. You've got family back in, in Germany and mm -hmm. your world right now, when people have breakfast in your household, it's like the United Nations because there's the Germans and the Australians that are in there. Do these also spill into family life? How do you, you know, help people navigate that? Because it's not just. Yeah. Oh, look, a hundred percent. Um, uh, you, you, I, I like the way you think uh, because you can see the the impact of it, right? So 100%, you can use that for any groups that want to be closer connected because, again, it comes back to protecting time and have something in common. Uh, so you can use that for social groups. Um, you can use that for book clubs. You can use that for families. You can even use that within your own family and make one day a week or one day a month where we talk about each other's each other's needs and um in fact 
Or is it something that's not my product, but I kind of just, as you say it, mm. something I ordered for my family just recently is this. Oh, talking points for the family. Okay. Yeah, so different business, but the idea is very similar where we have um, – where there's some cards and there's basically some questions in it and it all one question would be what's the nicest thing you've ever done for someone mm, you I know like and it really it really goes like that it's as simple as just having a conversation about something we don't normally don't talk about and we know from psychology and research that conversations and meaningful connections are the best and cheapest medicine to improve well-being and resilience. That sense of connection gives us hormones that where we just feel seen and safe and validated and we feel we belong. We have the feeling there's someone here listening to me. And that sense gives us so much um, sense of safety that all our alarm systems that are normally on all the time can actually rest and calm down for a moment. And that's where we become, I call it, our better selves. Absolutely. We we think alike. I have the same, but these are Kmart ones. I don't know if they're valid. Uh, oh, look at that. Yes. Because, Conversation status. Yes, because these are for kids. Um, and um, I just use them once in a while, you know, just to get started. But I, I can see what you're talking about, because if you're not fostering conversations and a wide array of topics, you know, it just resorts back to the mundane. Now, how can people get a hold of you and maybe get started, um, you know, if especially for their organizations to increase productivity and maybe just have a lot more stuff retention because people are actually communicating in the business? Oh, 100%. Retention is, is such a big one. Retention, um, yeah, look, if people don't feel accepted in the workplace, they mostly leave again and it's mostly it's actually the first six months in the workplace that where people have the highest risk of leaving <laughs> so <laughs> whatever you can build in and even look this team talk system could be one thing you could do in the first six months maybe with all new starters at the beginning so they do feel connected and seen and validated but yeah how to get in touch with me um so i have a website called teamtalks.com.au team talks when word.com.au um you will find me mostly on linkedin that's my most active social account um beata norden that's how you pronounce my name in case you're wondering um beata norden um how else email is beata b-i-r-t-h-e at teamtalks.com.au and that's how we get started definitely um would love to have a chat how you how I can be running the programs for you, or I can also help you setting it up internally. Like it's not rocket science, but it needs someone that I call the bootcamp coordinator. Yeah, someone needs to push it and get it started. And that's where I actually see my biggest strength. I'm like that bootcamp coordinator that gets it started for the first few months to get buy-in. And then I want leaders to become more and more influential and more and more competent to run it themselves that's my aim mm, absolutely i mean if it's going to be preventing conflict and also really really creating an environment where teams are going to be collaborating i think this is something that's a no-brainer for a lot of businesses out there and i'll make sure that we'll put all the uh, links in the show notes there so that people can actually get started obviously yeah is it is it something that people have to take out a mortgage for to get started or <laughs> no in fact um one of the reasons i built it quite um technology based is because i want people like i want to democratize that availability to to that service so what i normally say is if you work with me in a team of 10 it will the investment would be very similar to what you normally pay for one leader to be sent on a fancy leadership development program. Right. But you get 10 people involved instead and you have everyone uplifted at the same time. 
Yeah, and I think I think that actually makes more sense because by the time the leader comes back and tries to explain everything else, what they learned, it's all now Chinese whispers. And when, you know, nobody else cares because they're only just going to be talking about everything they had uh, at the conference and what, you know, their, um, you know, their fridge had in, 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 the, in the hotel that they <laughs> lived in, or, you know, or what snacks they had, <laughs> you know, and yeah. nothing else yeah. that be relevant. Now, I saw somewhere that you take people out on a bar hop, especially of the karaoke kind is that part of what uh, tim talks is all about talking into the microphone or is there any <laughs> you looked at you looked at what i what i like to do outside of work right because <laughs> <laughs> it's not all about talking. it is actually it is a good team building environment but yes yeah look i personally i, I love singing i'm part of a choir here in sydney as well um and yeah if you uh, if I'm on a fun night out. I like to go to the karaoke bar. And look, if the team wants to come with me, yeah, more than happy to. More than happy to. We can all sing and it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Before I interrupted you earlier, you were already singing Matthias' song, Fidam Shish This Is that also part of your karaoke list uh, when you when you go out? <laughs> no, it, it's not a 90 Luftballons by Nina. Ah, 99 red balloons that's the one yes that's an easy one to just go in even no matter how uh anyone is um tired or whatever fantastic yeah. now obviously um you know you you're doing a lot of work um in in this sort of area and you're also you know raising a family and things of that nature but you also mm. started your business what was the journey like uh you know to get this buy in from a lot of people as a solopreneur yeah that's the journey itself right so i had a business in germany uh 2 3 years when i started in the whole learning and development space and um I had a network, which was a lot easier. And then when I came back to Australia in 2017, so that's seven seven years ago now, I had to reestablish a network. I started with uh, being employed. Um, but then when I started this whole new idea of team talks, it was definitely a mind game. It is a mind game of believing in yourself um, and sometimes believing others more than I believed in myself. So I think the reason I continued was two things. One thing is I, I know I have a great idea and I really want to make a big impact. And the second one was every time I wanted to give up, someone else would go keep going. Mm. Well, I don't know how you see this, but almost everyone that is involved in these sort of uh, teachings is mm -hmm. also passing those uh, learnings to either their kids, their wives, and creating their own little environment. So whenever maybe you start thinking of giving up, don't do it for yourself. Do it for the for the kids that are actually going to benefit from daddy coming or mommy coming back from work energized and happy and still having time to play, uh, you know, soccer with them. So some of these things, yes, it might not seem like we are making any progress, but mm -hmm. it's the ripple effects that then come across. And I wish there will be people out there that will come to you and say, hey, thank you. Because of you, we are now connected to our families. We are now connected to our causes, our churches, and everything else that comes along with it. You're doing amazing work. And if, if anything... You know, the payoff might not be visible, but you're making a difference. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely, um, there is, my daughter is my muse. I found out throughout my journey. So really is when I, sometimes when I try to give up or my brain thinks I want to give up, then I look at her and I go, you know, what would I ask, what, would I, what advice would I give her if she was me? And I would always go, keep going, follow your passion. So that helps me. But the other story is that um, my husband used to work in a workplace that wasn't very pretty. 
Um, and, and that happened actually throughout me doing the business, but that's made me more passionate about it. So what happened that he had a 80s style manager that would go, I say you do or else. Mm. Yeah. And that on a regular basis, and not just against him, against everyone, the screaming in the workplace and threatening and pushing was accepted as normal. Right. Um, and it actually took me a while to figure out what the issue was. But when he came home, he wasn't aggressive, but he would need an hour or two to actually calm down. So he was physically present, but mentally not available. And that and, all on the family, I would suppose, because, you know, the kids are happy dad is home, but dad is not home. Exactly. Yeah, and they have a more, the kids are so sensitive about these things that nothing needs to be said, they just know. So that what made me, again, very passionate about creating workplaces where we have enough energy left in the tank when we come home. Nice. That's really, that's, you know, that's where it really counts. Now, I think the work that you're doing, especially really democratizing this whole team development for leaders, it really sort of, evens the playing field everybody's seen everybody is um heard and everybody is utterly respected because like you said we're not going to these jobs to put each other down we're actually there to lift each other up but it's the circumstances that then make it very difficult because it's like a ripple effect if the leaders are not responsible being accountable for their actions then it's all just going to spill down to the last person in the hierarchy and mm. imagine what their kids are also going through because they're getting the brunt of everybody else along the line. And if your husband needed two hours, then the last person probably needs a whole full day. And can you imagine <laughs> just, just to recover because they're getting everyone else's share um, yeah. of uh, bullying and everything else that comes along with it. Now, Obviously, you've done this, you've created something remarkable, and you're on your journey. What can people expect, Beate, from uh, all of this? What's what's in the future uh, for you? And yeah. Team talks. Yeah, absolutely. So you can definitely expect a team that is respecting each other more, and respect is the foundation to to grow trust and all the rest of it. So respecting each other for our strengths and weaknesses to be able to address difficult conversations with more courage. Because I know you mentioned before conflict, we will never avoid conflict, but how we view conflict, that is the difference. Are we looking at conflict via, oh, this is interesting. I wonder where that came from. Or are we looking at conflict of, oh, I take this personal. And when we are in that uplifted co consciousness, we can address conflict in a courageous manner, but still be respectful and know, hey, we've got each other's back. Mm. So that's really, we've got each other's back. Let's talk about what we need to talk about. Let's address the elephant in the room so it loses power over us. So that's what you can expect from Team Talks. Fantastic. I quite like that. And just summing it up, think pair share because i visually believe if you want to go far you go alone but if you want to go further you go together and if we can actually get people talking in their own realm in their own time in their own safety zones you know without the fear of being judged and also learning uh as they go i'm um, i think you know we're creating you know a very beautiful world one team at a time and um thanks to the work that you're doing there at uh, team talks um you know even though it doesn't come with a karaoke machine but i visually believe that <laughs> everything oh wait wait let me let me shake my cupboard <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so no absolutely um, and look um maybe just quoting adam grant who was just in sydney uh, a couple of weeks ago one of the thought leaders in in positive psychology and positive workplace culture um he's done research on learning and he found that if we just spend 1% on learning on a regular basis our teams and our companies will be over 200% more productive 
So other than creating a better team environment, what it leads to, I haven't really mentioned that, but it is higher productivity. Oh, I can imagine because so many people stop learning at age 12, you know, and that's about it for the rest of their lives. But if you have that culture of continuous learning, you really start awakening so many things that people never thought existed. And it really connects people because I think most uh, problems in business are just people problems. And it, it took a farm girl from a milk farm in, in yeah. Germany to discover <laughs> that if you really want cows to be productive with their milk, you actually have to communicate with them. Fantastic. <laughs> and there you have it, folks. A whirlwind journey <laughs> through the world of workplace industry uh, with the incredible beta herself. But hey, the fun is not over yet. Um, if you want to relive the magic and catch up on what you've missed, I encourage you to hit replay um, on this episode or just send this to your leader because I think they might learn a thing or two. And before you know it, um, you are now being put in the same programs where you can actually think for yourself, pair with the people that you're working with and share um, you know, your learnings as you grow with the team at uh, Team Talks. And hey, if ever you are going to be in need of insights and more laughs and more stories of triumph, don't forget to subscribe to the Online Prosperity Show. Um, help me thank Beata once again for taking the time to share with us um, you know, her passion and what it is that she is working on. Until next time, keep learning, keep spreading that prosperity as you think, as you pair with your friends and share um, you know, in the learnings that you are receiving. Bye for now.